Perry's book skillfully defends type physicalism against key anti-physicalist arguments, focusing on the zombie argument, the knowledge argument, and the modal argument. He challenges the assumption that the subject matter of a thought exhaustively determines its content, introducing the notion of reflexive content to analyze scenarios relevant to these arguments. Perry argues that accounting for reflexive content allows type physicalism to accommodate conceivability intuitions exploited by these arguments, undermining their force against physicalism. Perry terms his position antecedent physicalism, emphasizing that it doesn't provide evidence for physicalism, but demonstrates the impotence of these arguments against an independently established physicalism. Starting with the zombie argument, Perry contends that it primarily tests for epiphenomenalism rather than physicalism versus dualism. He asserts that physicalist epiphenomenalism can coexist with a world resembling the zombie world, where all physical causes and effects of sensations are present, but not the sensations themselves. Dualists affirming the causal efficacy of sensations would reject the possibility of the zombie world. Perry concludes that, given the rejection of epiphenomenalism, Chalmersian zombie worlds lack credibility, and even if possible, their existence would be neutral regarding physicalism versus dualism. Perry's critique of the zombie argument seems to misinterpret its core premise. While Perry introduces a stronger similarity requirement, insisting that the zombie world must approximate actual causal laws, the original zombie argument only requires physical indiscernibility from the actual world. Perry implies that the absence of non-physical sensations in the zombie world would alter physical events, contradicting causal efficacy in the actual world. However, Chalmers maintains that the zombie world involves different causal laws, illustrating the lack of entailment between physical and phenomenal facts, not asserting the causal independence of sensations. Moving to the knowledge argument, Perry develops the notion of reflexive content, aligning with the two-way strategy. He argues that Mary acquires a new belief linking a descriptive concept with a demonstrative slash recognitional concept, e.g., the qualitative feature of seeing red sensations. This link is formed through a reflexive belief about the subjective character of the experience. Perry suggests that Mary lacked an informational link between her detached and attached notions before her release. While accepting the two-way strategy, Perry contends there is a new fact at the level of reflexive content, asserting that Mary learns the co-reference of the two concepts. Regarding the modal argument, Perry notes its focus on conceivability as evidence of possibility. Kripke and Chalmers argue that even with perfect correlations between phenomenal and physical states, we can conceive of their separation, demonstrating their non-identity. Perry acknowledges this argument, but does not directly engage with the conceptual challenges arising from the relationship between demonstrative-slash-recognitional concepts and descriptive concepts, a concern relevant to both the knowledge and modal arguments. Perry critiques Kripke's and Chalmers' reliance on the subject matter assumption in establishing dualism on a priori grounds. He introduces the manila file folder analogy, illustrating that information about a person in a file can originate from various sources and be applied differently, emphasizing that satisfaction or denotation, condition 3, is just one aspect. Perry argues that Kripke and Chalmers still prioritize the descriptive factor, particularly in the case of phenomenal properties. 
while acknowledging the demonstrative slash recognitional core of phenomenal concepts, Perry asserts that attending to a sensation does not guarantee correct reference. He claims that reference involves source or applicandum, conditions 2 and 4, while attention primarily considers the descriptive contents, condition 3. Perry contends that when these aspects diverge, the phenomenal concepts source and applicandum may not align with the descriptive contents, leading to a sensation that doesn't fit the incorporated Humean ideas. This challenges the idea that the Humean idea of pain necessarily resembles a case of pain, especially if resemblance is a descriptive notion. Perry contests Kripke's and Chalmers' reliance on the subject matter assumption, arguing that scenarios incompatible with type identity physicalism are conceivable but not genuine possibilities. These scenarios involve situations like having zombie twins in a physically indiscernible world, experiencing what it's like to see red, for Mary, or having pain exist without sea fibers. Perry suggests that there are nearby possibilities explaining the mistaken belief in these scenarios, such as the false possibility that his phenomenal concept of pain references a state logically independent of C fibers. Contrarily, Kripke and Chalmers reject the view that causal factors like source and applicandum determine phenomenal concepts, asserting that these concepts lack a deferential component and do not index to any physical property. Perry's objections to token identity physicalism, which associates phenomenal properties with second-order physical properties, include a claim that phenomenal states must be local first-order inner states, and doubts about the conceptual link between phenomenal and second-order physical properties. While these objections work against token identity theories, they also raise questions about the conceptual basis for Perry's type identity physicalism. The challenge lies in demonstrating that first-order physical concepts can adequately analyze phenomenal concepts, potentially by arguing that it is a conceptual truth that phenomenal properties are defined by causal relations to their instances. Despite these challenges, the review acknowledges the book's significant strengths. Perry's thorough treatment of indexicality, reflexivity, and the distinction between knowing how and knowing that is praised. The book's engagement with classic philosophical themes, supported by quotations from Herbert Fagel, is recognized as a valuable contribution. The central achievement is seen in the nuanced exploration of the epistemic situatedness of thought and its implications for type identity physicalism, in resisting challenges from token physicalism and dualism.